you know, seeing like people really criticizing Hillary Clinton um, and I think Barack Obama because initially they hadn't supported gay marriage and then they changed their mind and did. And people, even liberal people, were criticizing them for changing their mind as if as if we <laughs> want them to hold prejudiced views <laughs> for the rest of their lives because they once did, once did. And I think that's it's such a weird mindset, but it's so prevalent in our culture that we see this as kind of flip-flopping. We assume that if someone changes their mind, it's like they don't have backbone or they don't have conviction. But actually, you know, obviously it is possible that people just change their mind to suit the kind of political wind, like um, just to, you know, uh, they're only thinking about their popularity. But I also think lots of people will just be changing their minds as they come across new evidence or as they've been persuaded to think about issues in a different way. And we should celebrate that rather than like punishing these people for having the decency to admit that they were wrong and that they, you know, they now hold a different belief. All right, David, well, welcome to the podcast. How are you today? Uh, very well, thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. Now, I know that you've written, uh, you've just finished writing a new book, which we can talk about maybe next summer, but I'd love to talk to you uh, a little bit about, in part, your writing skill and and how you craft the works that you've done as much because i've really enjoyed the books that you've written the intelligence trap and thank you uh the expectation effect um we had a conversation about the expectation effect at the cheltenham science festival which was which was superb as part of a panel um get, can i just i mean you're a, an award-winning science journalist how did you get into it um so a little bit by chance, actually, but um, it, it totally made sense in the end. Um, so I had always been kind of torn at school between um, kind of humanities and like English literature in particular and like foreign languages and then science, which I was always um, maybe slightly better at science than I was at the humanities. But, um, uh, you know, I also just had this kind of fundamental curiosity about um you know, the way the body works, the way the mind works, the way, the, you know, the universe uh, was formed. And so I had to make this choice at 16, you know, when you're picking your A-levels, and that pushed me down the sciences route. And I ended up studying maths at university. Um, and while I was doing that degree, even that was really, you know, interesting, it was, I realised just how much I missed um, kind of creative writing, um, thinking about language. Um, and so then when I graduated, I was really kind of in another dilemma for what career to pursue, but I just randomly saw um, a job advertised to be a news reporter at this small kind of technical scientific magazine. Um, and so I applied for that. I was really surprised to be interviewed and to get the job. Um, but as soon as I started out, I just realised it kind of totally clicked for me. Like I loved interviewing people. I loved like crafting a story and um, I've never really looked back. Um, so from there I moved to New Scientist and then the BBC and then I started writing my books. And, you know, I've loved this trajectory of moving from being like a news reporter to thinking um, and kind of creating on a much bigger canvas with the books to kind of tell, you know, like a big narrative about an area of science. But um yeah it's like for me it marries those two kind of interests that I've had from when I was very little and, and does your mathematics background help at all I'm curious as to whether you've just shelved it or whether it's useful I mean it does help on a couple of levels um I mean kind of prosaically it helps for me to just know understand statistics um you know like to understand when a result is reliable um you know whether it's likely to be replicated um you know that fundamental literacy has been really important and i did kind of during my degree specialize in statistics um so that's absolutely helped when i'm like looking into medical research or psychological research um but also like i think strangely i think there's 
there are quite a few analogies between mathematical problem solving and writing and I can only describe it as being you know when you're at university level maths and you might have this problem to solve that's going to take like you know hours or the whole day for you to solve and you're having to juggle so many different ideas in your head at one go and like pursue lots of different avenues of thought some of which are going to be dead ends and others are going to be more fruitful and I actually I get the same feeling that I had during my degree when I'm you know planning a feature or planning the structure of a book that actually that was really good training for me to be able to I guess think out abstractly but also to um, just like it was a training in the creative process even though the two disciplines couldn't seem to be more different. Mm, that's interesting. And when did you feel like you could go from that transition of, of articles through to books? When did you think, I'm, I'm interested in writing something more substantial than perhaps something that someone might read in a few minutes? Yeah, I mean, that did take a bit of a leap of faith. Like it, it definitely wasn't, I wasn't certain that I'd be able to do it. Um, uh, I mean, it was just, I guess, while I was working at the BBC, for, uh, I'd come across a lot of research on intelligence and the problems of the ways that we define intelligence and then, you know, other abilities and traits that might be useful for better decision making. Um, and it just felt too big for an article. And actually, it felt right. like it should be, um, you know, you really to understand it and to be able to apply it, you really needed, you know, to paint this research on a much bigger canvas um and so that's when I thought like really I do want this to be a book um so I approached an agent and she helped me to craft a proposal which was 30,000 words so about a third of the length of the final book um and I think that process really did prepare me then to write the whole book because I'd already started thinking about all of the narrative techniques I could use to kind of draw a reader through, you know, from page one to page 300. Um, in some ways, writing a book is a bit like writing a sequence of feature articles, but obviously you do need to have those different narrative threads that are going to carry people from the beginning to the end. It can't just, they can't each be kind of separate independent pieces. They have to um, carry the same theme and the same characters sometimes to get people to really engage with the material. Mm, okay, so that's that's interesting in itself. That's a journalistic technique or a, a writing technique that mm. I'm I'm not familiar with. I mean, I haven't written a book, but I've, I've probably got away with it as much as anything. But that's a deliberate act of mm. of being able to select material, identify uh, topics that resonate throughout, that build momentum uh as as you go how do you form that yeah i mean it takes it's a real headache <laughs> often i'd say <laughs> it's the mathematic um, formulaic formulaic problem solving exactly well i mean for my first book i found it a real headache and then for my second it just it fell out kind of in place as soon as i started planning it um i think that was the nature of the material but for the first one yeah it was difficult because there's, you don't want to be repetitive, but you want to be able to, uh, you know, you want your readers to be able to remember kind of how the different chapters are interlinked and how you're building that argument. So one of the big challenges for me was to just provide those little reminders and signposts to let people know kind of where you're going and to remind them where you've been, uh, but without making it too kind of formulaic or... Um, you don't want to have those signposts kind of glaring in each paragraph because that can actually be very irritating for the reader. But yeah, it's really, I guess, the fundamental process is putting yourself in the mind of the reader and thinking like, what are the, the main questions that they're going to ask, you know, having read what they've just read and how can I then address those and move on the story in the way that I want to, to get to the um, kind of final, you know, end point of that narrative. Yeah, and I mean, you've got lovely phrases there about painting research um, on a bigger canvas. Um, is that is that some something that you have in mind about what's the final effect of my writing? You're thinking about the end reader as opposed to mm. 
your stream of consciousness or how you've interpreted it is that something that you you're training all the time or is something that you're naturally feeling yeah i mean a lot of it is intuition i think like i i guess that is from my experience as a journalist as well those 15 years of just kind of developing an intuition for when something's working and when it isn't and you know all of my writing but especially my books go through so many revisions so i'll write the first draft um revise it kind of um you know a few days after i've finished that one chapter and then i'll revise it again a few months later and then again kind of once the whole book has been written so it's like a process of refinement i guess and the advantage of leaving those big spaces of time between writing and revising is that um i can approach it afresh as if i'm right. a reader who's um who's not so familiar with the material and that's when i find like those gut feelings kind of really kick in that just tell me like you know this is this section which i thought was really interesting when i was writing it is actually uh too much of a, a of a distraction or that you know and then you know at the final kind of revision when i'm reading the whole book from beginning to end and revising it that's when i become more it becomes more apparent that actually you know two uh two chapters might have this kind of harmony this kind of resonance that i hadn't noticed before and you want to make the most of that or that actually some you know two separate sections might feel very discordant and when you're writing them independently you didn't notice that but when you're coming back to the revisions you notice that actually they jar too much in like perhaps the tone um you know the style of storytelling or in the material itself and then you have to find some way to kind of tweak them readjust them or even rewrite them to to get them to uh to produce the effect that you want mm. so it sounds like it's a a reflection but a structured sort of routine of you doing the work setting it aside coming back afresh reviewing and and then your own sort of creative processes and review um and how much of that is is informed by your your sort of editor shaping your own writing style previously i've definitely learned a lot from my editors um i remember for my first book um my editor had told me that i sounded too cautious in the way right. i was writing it so and um i at the time i wasn't sure i agreed because i feel like there are a lot of books where the author sounds supremely confident in what they say and they've got like one message I won't mention names but they've got like one message that they hammer home again and again and again and it often fails to uh acknowledge the kind of nuances and uncertainty that is sometimes inherent in the research um but so but then I felt like we came to a compromise with um how I approached it and actually you can I think there are always clever ways that you can incorporate those nuances into the narrative uh but without sounding too hesitant and actually making making those uh those kinds of uncertainties like an inherent part of the story um and i think readers appreciate that they want to know like i could have said with the expectation effect for example that 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 you know you can create self-fulfilling prophecies that will benefit every single area of your life and that you're you know i could have painted it as something a bit like the secret um but a kind of scientifically proven secret but um but actually like i think readers appreciated the fact that i was quite careful to say like it will work in these circumstances but not those circumstances and you know just it, it's uh I feel like it's a much more honest way of painting the research and I think people respond to that and it doesn't mean that you have to sound doubtful but you just have to be very clear about which bits you are confident about and which bits you aren't. Uh, I might come back to that because I think in looking through the intelligence trap that the, you're covering some quite controversial areas it was potentially quite confronting for some people who who might have fallen into these traps I might, I might come back to that in a moment if I could but I'm just curious to sort of just finally ask you about your sort of writing process do you have do you have a routine 
and a structure and a way in which you write or does it do you wait for the inspiration or do you every morning make a cup of tea and wait for the birds to tweet and then you're off um at a certain mm -hmm. time how, how do you how do you go about it because i've got a sense that as a as a full-time writer journalist you have to do the work you have to commit mm -hmm. to it yeah i am quite uh quite disciplined i wouldn't say i'm like the most i'm certainly not the most conscientious or organized person but um but yeah in terms of like you know sitting down and and carving out time each day to write like i do do that all the time um you know i, I and i kind of do create a schedule you know at the start of the book to kind of know roughly where i want to be at each you know stage of the process up to my deadline um uh you know i have bad days where like it just doesn't feel like it's flowing well and i have good days where it feels like it's flowing quite easily um but i do think like my main error with writing the intelligence trap uh which made it a lot more stressful was that i um i kind of really wanted to know up front exactly how a chapter would be structured and then I felt like, you know, I'd have this very intricate plan and then it'd just be like joining the dots. Um, that actually proved to be a big waste of time. I've learned now that once I've done the initial research, once I have a good feeling for how the argument is going to unfold, it's much better for me to just kind of sit down and write out a very rough draft um, and then spend more time revising that kind of after it's been written rather than over planning beforehand and I think that's just that when you're talking about you know even long articles but especially something like a book there's just too much for the brain to be able to hold all in one time you can't preempt every creative decision you're going to have to make in advance sometimes you just have to write it and to see you know and to make those decisions as you go through it rather than yeah having a blueprint basically so it sounds like there's just trusting the sort of serendipitous creative brain processes that that the connections are going to be made and that you might be writing something and you don't know what comes next but you then try something and um does it is there an irony here about did you try and over intellectualize the the writing of the intelligence trap <laughs> Yeah, I think I did. You yeah. said you fell into the intelligence trap, didn't you? <laughs> exactly. Right, the intelligence trap. That that's yeah. an infinite <laughs> loop. That. I mean, I would say I've um reached a kind of sweet point now. So I I don't really think it would be useful for me to just sit down without any plan in front of me. But I think right. I just need a rough plan. I don't need a very detailed plan. And that's because if I hit like a block while I'm writing, and it's like and then I, I can just go back and do the research, the very precise research for what I think I need to kind of resolve that problem. Um, and that, what I was finding when I was doing the very detailed plan up front was that I was still having to do that anyway. So I just basically, and a lot of the research I've done up front was just ended up not being part of the book at all. So it's just kind of streamlining that process. Um, it's not a complete revolution in the way I write. Um, I'm definitely not writing kind of stream of consciousness, but um, but it is, yeah, you're right that I think I did over intellectualize um, the writing of the intelligence trap and <laughs> um, tried to be too systematic in the way I went about it rather than having more faith in my intuitions as I was going through the creative process. Mm, interesting. Um, well, that that's nice in itself in that it, it probably recognizes a great illustration of of how some sort of formal structure and logical mathematical approach to something needs to be met with a more emotional uh, or interpersonal or feeling based approach and um, I think my my connection with the book is informed by just that where I see great sports science practitioners leaders doing it by rote and i've done an mba in this or i'm trying to follow a structured researching methodology and i'm trying to work with athletes that are super complex 
uh, individuals, but in a very unique context, and there's lots of moving parts. And I've seen both approaches of an in intellect or an emotional uh, intelligence be very effective. And, yeah. and I've also seen both approaches not work, and particularly so on the intelligence side of it, where someone comes in and just tries to defeat everybody with their raw brain horsepower. Um, what, what motivated you to write The Intelligence Trap? I mean, it was, it came out of my journalism. And essentially, like I, you know, would come across a lot of stories while I was, you know, writing about science of these, um, you know, like amazing physicists who would then you know, there was no doubting their intellectual capability, but then you'd hear about their, you know, private views on issues like climate change, for example, and you just think like, you know, you're not looking at the evidence here. You're, there's something that, there's some, somehow you're not able to kind of logically weigh up the evidence in the same way that, you know, most of your peers are. Um, and I'll give one, example was um, the Nobel Prize winner, Kerry Mullis. Um, so he was um, a biologist who came up with the polymerase chain reaction, the, you know, the PCR that we used in our COVID tests, but actually has been really transformative with the whole of biological research in, you know, it's used in genetic testing, um, you know, uh, all hospitals now will do PCR tests. Um, uh, you know, is involved in like the human genome project, but he, <laughs> like, his autobiography is so bizarre in that he denied that CFCs were causing the hole in the ozone layer. He denied that the HIV, the um, HIV virus, was the cause of AIDS. Um, he denied that carbon emissions were causing global warming. He believed in astrology. He said astrology was better than psychological research for predicting human behavior. He thought he could travel to the astral plane. You know, it it was just really striking to me that you could he could have had this flash of brilliance in discovering the um, polymerase chain reaction. Um, but in all these other ways, he was a very irrational person. So I really then wanted to understand, you know, what what is it about intelligence, like as we've measured it with like IQ tests that we've been missing, that isn't apparent, that isn't capturing, you know, that kind of level of rational decision making um, or belief formation. And so I looked into it, and actually, there's been a huge amount of research on this exact subject, looking at how IQ. Um, it's related to things like our susceptibility to um, cognitive biases and fake news and all of that. And what you see is that there's often not a strong correlation at all between someone's IQ or their academic performance and all of those other measures of rationality. So that that feels like that uh, is similar to the title of your first chapter of the intelligence traps. Yeah. You know that expertise can fuel stupidity. What what's mm. happening there? What what why is that? In that, if somebody can evaluate PCR and and assess the the relevance and the appropriate specificness of that as a test for particular conditions, but is unable to evaluate astrology against similar <laughs> criteria, yeah. what's 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 missing or what's what's present there that means that they can fall into those traps, as you put it. Yeah, I mean, I think like, there's, you know, lots of things going on with someone like Kerry Mullis. Um, yeah, okay. but... <laughs> <laughs> not, <laughs> not, not him specifically, but 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 yeah. generally then. No, no, yeah, exactly. I mean, he is a good example <laughs> of this. But, um, but, you know, there's so many others. It's like I talk about Arthur Conan Doyle, you know, a scientist mm -hmm. and an amazing writer who, you know, shows he understands um kind of logical deduction brilliantly with the Sherlock Holmes books but then was also fooled by all of these uh spiritualists and mediums who were like defrauding him of his money um and he had friends like the illusionist Harry Houdini who was actually a, a complete skeptic and 
you know, was telling him like, no, these, um, you know, like he could say like, I know how they're fooling you, they're doing it through these methods. And Arthur Conan Doyle's response was not to be like, oh, okay, like you've got a point, maybe I'll adjust my opinions. Instead, he came up with this belief that Houdini was actually some kind of fairy being who <laughs> was denying the existence of the paranormal to cover up his own the his own truth about his past. Um, so, you know, this is actually, you do see it in a lot of intellectual figures. And I think what's happening in all of these cases is that people come to form, um, we, most of us come to form, in fact, our beliefs quite um, intuitively. Uh, and then we have a very strong connection to that belief. It becomes part of our identity. In Arthur Conan Doyle's case, I think it was like, you know, the spiritualism was very important for him to help him to um, to kind of cope with like the death of his son, for example. Um, and then once we form that belief, we actually just use our intellect to defend the belief. And so someone who's more intelligent actually has kind of more tools at their disposal to form those justifications that are necessary and to demolish any of the arguments against them. So someone like Arthur Conan Doyle, you know, he was drawing on these theories of electromagnetism that were very cutting edge at the time to try to explain how, you know, the paranormal could exist um, at wavelengths that were invisible to the human eye, for example. So he was actually using his intelligence and knowledge there to kind of fuel that justification for spiritualism. Um, the same with um, Kerry Mullis. I think he he was just, because he had this very strong, I don't know where it came from, intuitive belief that HIV wasn't causing AIDS. He was then, you know, analysing these scientific papers, but actually kind of creating very tortuous justifications for why the evidence was wrong and he was right. Someone who was less intelligent, I don't think would have been able to kind of, you know, create those, um, that, um, that amazingly contorted argument that he was doing. Um, so that's, in a nutshell, that's what it is in the, those cases. But I think actually, you know, we're all susceptible to this um, in the formation of our political beliefs where we will justify our own party and, you know, knock down any political opponents, often in a very hypocritical way. But the more intelligent you are, the better you're able to kind of form those justifications again. Hmm. And my um, and, and let me ask this question first because I've I've got a sort of an analogy in sport that that might be relevant. But um, did you see that there was any association between certain personality characteristics that might map to uh, this susceptibility to fall into, I guess, to a certain degree, sloppy? or a lack of evidence thinking. Um, I'm thinking of open-mindedness, closed-mindedness uh, right. as a personality trait. Um, and that feels like if you are closed-minded, you might be able to stick to a particular view, uh, but bend reality or bend the evidence or yeah. surface uh, a limitation of a study that is stretching plausibility and lacking reason rather than staying open-minded. Is there, are there any um, particular personality characteristics like that that you saw related to uh, this, this, um, this trap? There were, and I think that's a great example because that is essentially what I'm talking about is that, um, you know, you might have a very sloppy study <laughs> that like would fail on all kinds of criteria, but someone like Kerry Mullis might use that as the kind of keystone of their argument um, and then they might take like a very robust study and they might find what they think is one tiny error that for most people would not really uh, it has no bearing on the conclusions but they would like really focus on that and build their whole argument about that one kind of a chink in the armor um, so that that is the kind of thing that we're looking at here and that's how you then you know you it appears that you're building up all of the you know, evidence on your side and knocking down the evidence against it, even though actually, like, um, objectively speaking, that's not the case at all. Um, and so, yeah, there are 
absolutely the open-mindedness is a known personality trait um and this isn't just that kind of open-minded like oh i'll try a bit of everything but it's you know specifically designed with um defined uh through these questionnaires that would ask people like do you um take time to uh look for evidence contrary to your opinion um do you acknowledge your errors and update your thinking when someone's pointed out a mistake um you know all of um all of those factors uh kind of come to to form this personality trait of open-mindedness and what you find is that people who are actively open-minded in that way the people who really do look to to find that evidence that might question their point of view and then treat it fairly um they are much less susceptible to this intelligence trap which is called motivated reasoning the one i'm talking about um intellectual humility is another one um curiosity is another one they're all related but can be defined you know in slightly different ways but people who are curious who just have this kind of real love of learning you know they always want to find out something new they are immune to the intelligence trap because if they find something that um kind of questions their opinion or doesn't chime with their um world view rather than feeling kind of threatened by that and feeling that they have to tear it down they just think this is a new opportunity to like to learn something new to get that kind of dopamine kick when they find out something fresh and interesting and so they will actively pursue that and you know that is so protective then against this motivated reasoning if when you're confronted with something that doesn't make sense to you you don't just dismiss it but you actually you know dig deeper to to truly understand kind of how that fits with what you thought you knew um curiosity is something that we can cultivate um there's evidence in education that actually really little kids are super curious they'll ask like hun- up to 100 questions an hour um as they go through school and the kind of rigid lessons that um it, definitely in the past we had in school are where questions aren't encouraged um you know question asking drops to one an hour or less by the time they reach you know um junior school even so it's definitely something that education mm-hmm. could be trying to i think we need to constrain um or channel children's question asking in a way that can be productive because obviously it can be a distraction in lessons but what you don't want to do is actively discourage that curiosity to understand and to dig deep um into something new that um that you don't fully understand at the moment Mm. and i'd you know absolutely encourage that i think one of the um interesting observations i've done over the years working with sort of postgraduates who you'd think have got more sort of deeper reasoning and when I've gone in and done um, like a little local as- school assembly when my kids are, you know, talking about science and some of the questions that come from eight-year-olds, I think, wow, there's, there's a level of creativity there that, that has just been squashed in a postgraduate pool. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't want to um, this like this. Um, like certain degrees but there there is good uh, evidence that like generally um open-mindedness does fall the further into education someone goes right up to kind of undergraduate degrees and phds and beyond um and if you look at measures of kind of critical thinking actually for certain degrees like i think um business studies was one you actually find that um yeah critical thinking doesn't just kind of plateau it actually decreases during the degree so you you have to question like what people are being taught and how we could you know change that how it could be rewarded to be a critical thinker in those degrees right i was well i was working with a ceo of a pharmaceutical company yesterday mm. and he's talking about the the responsibility of gene editing techniques and mm. how there are so many moving parts the technology is moving so quickly that they don't know what the future holds. They, they genuinely don't. But they've all come from a, an MBA background and mm. they're all taught that it's this way in life. And there's a formula to it. And he was, he was talking about just how 
how important it is to be nurturing the curiosity and the reflective review yeah. and healthy processes to take the intelligence out of their experience rather than thinking here's a playbook that we can just roll out for a future that is unknown um, yeah. so that that's fascinating in itself yeah i mean i think you know that that is why like learning to escape the intelligence trap is so important because it makes us more flexible thinkers that can adapt you have to be able to adapt your opinions and your way of working when you're faced with new evidence but unfortunately you know with the intelligence trap being the way it is lots of people when something new comes along that questions what they're doing they just kind of um they become more entrenched they react against it rather than you know updating and growing as a result of this new challenge um and you know i think like you know going back to those kind of university degrees i think sometimes we are rewarded for building a convincing argument um a persuasive argument but i don't think the criteria that are used to kind of you know grade essays necessarily also always look at intellectual honesty for like um you think the critical thinking skills that we would really want people to appreciate so actually you know being even handed in your appraisal of the evidence for and against your case for example um yeah i think and i think this is pervasive not just in education but in our culture like it's you know there's a lot of emphasis on like being persuasive um and you're kind of not rewarded if you do actually going back again to kind of what my editor had told me you're often not rewarded for being for acknowledging uncertainty and mm. um and incorporating multiple points of views i suppose the the obvious area there is is politics um that mm. w we set out uh, a manifesto four years ago and we've changed our mind now um mm. in in light of evidence is this isn't a particular comment on any policy but no. when someone's changed their mind in light of evidence yeah. it's called a u-turn and it's right. it's definitely a black mark against yeah against your decision making you've changed right. your mind what you know as opposed yeah. to ah why and what's the evidence for that and is that going to help us more in the future right exactly i remember you know seeing like people really criticizing hillary clinton um and i think barack obama because initially they hadn't supported gay marriage and then they changed their mind and did and people even liberal people were criticizing them for changing their mind as if as if we <laughs> want them to hold prejudiced views <laughs> for the rest of their lives because they once did once did and i think that's it's such a weird mindset, but it's so prevalent in our culture that we see this as kind of flip-flopping. We assume that if someone changes their mind, it's like they don't have backbone or they don't have conviction. But actually, you know, obviously it is possible that people just change their mind to suit the kind of political wind, like um, just to, you know, uh, they're only thinking about their popularity. But I also think lots of people will just be changing their minds as they come across new evidence or as they've been persuaded to think about issues in a different way. And we should celebrate that rather than like punishing these people for having the decency to admit that they were wrong and that they, you know, they now hold a different belief. And I know it's, a, uh, I think it's a, a trap that I can see happen for a lot of people in my field where the conviction with which you state something really helps buy in. If you're working with an athlete or a coach or a team, you say, this is the, this is the way that we should do it. This is what's coming up. This is how we need to approach it. You get, you see them get a, a self sort of confidence of actually, yeah, mm. this person knows what they're on about. They, they are instructing, they're helping me go forward. When my scientific mind, never really wants to fall into an absolutist set, uh, exactly. perspective um it 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 grates when i hear it 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 grates when i think i'm going to do this <laughs> and yeah. an absolute we probably need to do this it's a softer way of presenting mm. um probabilistically this is the the approach that 
that might stand us in best uh, best stead, but it's maybe not as convincing. Maybe it's not hasn't got the rhetoric of a politician, or it feels like it's persuasive. So it feels like a trap that you might fall into to make something happen, as opposed to any sense of causing doubt in someone else's mind. But it's probably a more mature way of of working. It is, and I mean, when you're overconfident, overly dogmatic, when you present a very simplistic solution to a problem, you're just overlooking um, like it's never going to be the actual truth, basically. And so you're, you're actually, it's, it's putting everyone at a disadvantage when you do that. Um, like you said, it's not a scientific way of looking at problems because context is always going to matter. Um, um, I'm not entirely convinced that I think we overestimate how convincing it is to other people when we present ourselves as being overconfident. And I think Vanessa Bones, who we were talking about in the pre-chat, mm. you know, um, a scientist at um, Ship Cornell University, That's I think. Right. Yeah. She, you know, she, I think she talks about in her book, um, You Have More Influence Than You Think, about the fact that <laughs> You know, you, when you're giving people, say, dietary advice, if you are like, you must change your diet to these foods, or if you just suggest it, you might think about changing your diet to these foods, people are actually much more likely to take up the advice in the latter case, when you present it less forcefully, when you acknowledge, when you give people the autonomy and and the sense that actually it's their personal decision and that there might be other ways to go about their health as well so I think we overestimate that and especially in politics as well there's good research showing that when you're talking to someone who has differing political beliefs um small like hedge words where you're acknowledging your own doubts and uncertainty about your beliefs and expressing curiosity in the other person's um that is actually much more likely to change the other person's opinion and to get them to consider your um, opinion more seriously than if you talk with absolute confidence and certainty. I need to go back and listen to our, my own conversation with Vanessa so uh, <laughs> to, to update. And um, evidence resistance then, you've mentioned that as, a, as an idea and um, that sense of suggesting that individuals in leadership, maybe high performance roles, um, perhaps to, to a degree of status, uh, might have a, a greater resistance to evidence that contradicts their their beliefs. What did you uncover in that particular uh, chapter? Yeah, I mean, it's very, you know, obviously writing about politics is quite tricky at the moment because I was always conscious of the possibility of offending whatever side you present, you're going to offend someone. And actually, I think like the intelligence track when it comes to political disagreements is probably evident on both sides. I don't think the left or the right are any more or less susceptible to this. Um, but it is very difficult for you to be able to, uh, you know, open your own mind and open other people's minds. Um, I do think we should be, you know, looking at the kind of um, log in our own eye before we <laughs> criticise the spec in other people. So, you know, we should be thinking about how we can become more open minded ourselves. And one technique that I mentioned in the intelligence trap that we can use is this process called self distancing. And that is, um, it's apl applicable in all kinds of areas, but actually, in the realm of politics, it's just really useful for you to try to imagine the perspective of someone who's not involved in this particular debate. So if you're talking about the US elections, for example, or the UK elections, imagine what someone in Iceland will think about the two candidates. Like, How would they appraise you know, the strengths and weaknesses of those people? And what you find is that when people take that um, outside perspective, they just, it removes that um, kind of, emotional charge from the debate that can fuel that motivated reasoning, that form of the intelligence trap that causes us to become closed-minded. Um, so they, 
when they you know imagine those elections from the perspective of someone from Iceland they actually just become more open-minded more likely to consider multiple perspectives to you know admit their own uncertainty about these issues to um you know to follow up with like a research you know on both sides of the the debate um so that is something that we can do to improve our own um thinking and then in terms of like changing other people's minds or having constructive discussions um i think we you know i do think like again like acknowledging our own uncertainty it becomes a bit contagious so the other person's more likely to do so um we should follow the what's called like the montague principle which um is named after lady workley montague who said that civility costs nothing and buys everything um just be polite don't resort to kind of ad hominem attacks because you know that is not only going to damage your own um it's not only going to alienate the people on the other side of the debate it actually alienates people who are undecided or even people you know who would be more likely to be kind of on your own team um rudeness just never really pays in these kinds of arguments I mean, I love that quote that you uh, surfaced uh, from William James um, saying a great many people think they are thinking when they're merely rearranging their prejudices. And and that in itself provides you with just a little bit of a check and challenge to you. <laughs> to, what am right. I producing? What am I, you know, the, my I've assembled a thought. Here it goes. Um, and to at least recognize this is this is informed by my own personal experiences my biases um mm. from my point of view of an educational training route uh, a yeah. social economic background it's all a product of everything that i've been or experienced or come up with as opposed to um the reality <laughs> or or yeah. solving it perfectly as you might do in maths yeah exactly and you know some it is something that i'm consciously aware of personally um yeah i mean i don't really comment on politics on any of my social media because i'm so aware of that um but i don't also because i'm not an expert and i feel like people sometimes should restrict <laughs> their output to their expertise um and i don't think anyone really would care what i think about these things but yeah i think it's something that we can all apply is recognizing that fact and it doesn't mean that you don't have to have convictions there will be some things that you very strongly believe in but even if you have that very strong conviction um you know you might still want to update the way you see the way you you see that issue or the way you approach other people about that issue um i don't think any belief should be so strong that you are unwilling to shift even a tiny bit based on new evidence um and it's going to backfire like if you you might feel like you know showing your passion and your conviction is you know is the best way for you to achieve your goals and that is a kind of sign of weakness if you if you have these conversations with people who disagree with you but actually um it's only by having those respectful conversations that you're ever going to actually achieve the change that you desire yourself and the only way you can have constructive conversations is to at least be receptive to other people's points of views and curious about them so yeah it's something i think that william james quote really captures something that's so mm. important for all of us it's something that we should really live by and that is that we should always be willing to question whether we are actually capable of changing our mind or whether we are just rearranging our prejudices was was that part of your bullshit detection kit um <laughs> or, or maybe we should say degrees of bullshit you know the because <laughs> the, there might be some you know 99 percent bullshits and there might be some 85 percent. so yeah. what, could you could you give us some some of your top tips about how to recognize that those um that, that misinformation yeah i mean there's a lot of good research showing that if you actually teach people explicitly um critical thinking skills um 
then they are much better at detecting bullshit and fake news and you know questioning conspiracy theories um but we're not taught those skills at school formally i think the assumption was that we would pick them up just naturally with a, a good education but you know they have to be taught um with good examples you know it can be part of other courses like history for example you can have mm. elements of kind of bullshit detection when you're discussing historical sources um so it absolutely you know can be integrated into our education but it isn't at most in most schools or universities at the moment um but this you know bullshit detection it's sometimes hard to apply but like it is you know like any kind of literacy it helps to have lots of practice and that you know some of those skills are the ones we've spoken about before just like questioning um like rather than just gathering the information that naturally fits your point of view like try to look for a source that might challenge your point of view so if you see a piece of fake news that I don't know is accusing the Democrats of having this paedophile ring around some pizza restaurant in Washington DC you know go to other sources to see like what they say about those rumors and you know be open to the fact that they might challenge this attractive story if you happen to be um to hate the Democrats you know accept that um you know other literacy skills are just like you know checking the sources like how well established is this you know news outlet that you're looking at who's funding it what it, why would it be in this group's interest to be selling this particular piece of news you know like often there will be lots of vested interest there um recognize logical fallacies and the kind of tools of manipulation um a common one will be for people to kind of spread these um kind of fake surveys where you'll you'll see you know something like uh well first of all like this was used in the tobacco wars of the 60s and 70s so you would see these surveys showing that like you know these 500 scientists all smoke and say that smoking is actually good for your health and then you it sounds convincing until you kind of look into the backgrounds of these people and they might not be who've signed this petition and they might not be scientists at all or they're paid by the tobacco industry or their expertise is not in biology or medicine but it's in you know some obscure part of geology meaning that they have no expertise in um and you know how cigarettes could be causing cancer um so that was a technique that tobacco companies had used spreading these kind of this false consensus this idea of a false consensus to be very persuasive um but you'll see that all the time now when you're looking at questions like climate change though you know it was a very popular or very widely shared um uh poll that did exactly the same thing it kind of had a list of supposed scientists who had signed up saying that they um didn't believe that human carbon emissions caused climate change and then you look down the list of names and you can see it was open for anyone to to sign whether or not they were a scientist whether or not they were a real person so you had like signatures from people like dr jerry halliwell of the spice girls um you know it's very easy to create the illusion of a, of a false consensus but actually you would find if you questioned actual um climate scientists there's by far you know the overwhelming majority of like 97 percent of scientists who agree um in the causes of climate change um so it's being aware of those kinds of manipulation techniques and that's why i think having an understanding of the history of misinformation can be very useful because once you understand say how the tobacco industry had formed had tried to use that tactic for one kind of culture war it's easy for you to then recognize when it's being used against you now for a completely different issue yeah and i can i i can see why there's real quality in your writing because you have evaluated evidence as you've gone and that statistical background is is critical for that just to be able to pick up the difference between say a study that's found say going from 10 in a thousand uh people who uh 
eat cherries that re and it reduces their uh, <laughs> uh, cardiovascular disease and it's gone up right. to 14 if you don't so it's a 40 percent increase if you don't eat cherries you know mm. the, these sorts of statistical yeah. manipulations that that newspapers love don't they but it but it it is a sloppy interpretation of statistics or it, it's simply used to create clicks or to get attention or to present a, a particular view exactly and you know sometimes even organizations like the world health organization mm. have been guilty of maybe right. not presenting information as responsibly as possible i remember when they said they'd classified asbestos um classified bacon as in the same um category of car carcinogenic products as asbestos it's factually true but <laughs> eating bacon is not going to be as dangerous as eating um asbestos what they were talking about was that there had been enough studies um showing that there was a a statistical link between bacon and um cancer to be put in that category but what they were completely ignoring was the nature of the the absolute risk that bacon was forming we do know that bacon does increase the risk of um bowel cancer but like you said the absolute change in risk is fairly small i think if you had like compared like a hundred people who ate no bacon at all to a hundred people who only ate bacon um the difference would be one person getting bowel cancer which is not to be ignored but i feel like the public deserve to be told that particular statistic when informing their decision because it might also be that someone just wants to have a bit of bacon once or twice you know a month and then maybe the increased risk is not going to be so important that they need to worry about that. Um, I actually think when we present health information, um, I'm not so going to say dishonestly because it was technically accurate, but I don't think it presented it in the with the nuances that we needed. I think when you miss those nuances, it's actually going to backfire because um, people just, you know, they can sense when something isn't right, even if they can't explain why. And then they're less likely to observe that um health advice but also many maybe many other pieces of advice as well because it erodes trust in the institutions so yeah i think like um you know the the honest and nuanced presentation of statistics is something that we should all be striving for as science communicators and i think we need to have faith that actually the public are intelligent enough to understand those nuances and that they can then you know that we should be giving them those nuances to inform their their own decisions rather than trying to thrust a narrative upon them mm. yeah i have a, a sarcastic slide set which says that if i have seven hazelnuts one mandarin and three cups of coffee every day i'm going to add 27 years to my life expectancy which yeah. you know and you could just go additive and add additive couldn't you when when actually then if you have a couple of eggs some rashes of bacon and some wine and and you're back down to net zero so you don't, you haven't yeah. actually um actually benefited it, it sort of leads me on a little bit to the to your second book the expectation effect and i'm curious to sort of see if there's a link here in terms of the sort of information that pre is presented to people and their potential commitment and belief to that that might provide them with a health benefit or um, a performance benefit and and we're, we're we're in here about that that concept of placebo as much as as anything but when you were starting to to look into the the resourcefulness that can be developed through your own mindset or how information is presented what were some of the major things that that really stood out in this area for you mm, i mean there's so many um yeah i mean so yeah the placebo effect uh, effect i think was you know quite well known um but what really surprised me when i was digging into this research was just how much the research has moved on over the last 10 years to show that actually similar 
expectation effects that are basically is the same principle that your beliefs about exercise or diet or the aging process um, are going to shape the outcomes. Actually, we do see that in all these different areas of life. It's affecting our health every day in ways that we hadn't realised. In the past, we just thought that the placebo effect was relevant, you know, when you're taking a medication um, in a hospital or, you know, at your doctor's surgery. But it's not like that at all. It's actually, you know, each day we'll have expectations about something like what we're eating, what activities we're doing. They're going to shape really important outcomes. Um, the result that really surprised me and kind of inspired me to write the book was this... Um, uh, finding from 2002 that people who have a positive view of aging um so people who see uh they might recognize you know some of the downsides of aging but they also see the good sides of it too that actually you know retirement can be a time of new opportunity and growth um and that actually your wisdom like scientific measures of like decision making improve with age as people get older and the people who recognize those benefits of aging and embrace them are likely to live around seven and a half years longer than the people who assume their life is just going to get worse as they get older. Um, now, that sounds like the kind of study that I would have been, you know, pretty skeptical of. And I was. Um, I mean, the, the methods used in the study were perfectly sound and it was based on a big sample of people that found that people's beliefs in you know, these were measured before any illnesses had developed, you know, in middle age, um, and they'd then controlled for, you know, people's health at that stage, and they still found this effect. So that was, it was a good study as far as it went, but it's been replicated just so many times since then. And my criteria is always like, do we have signs of expectation effects from, you know, multiple labs using multiple techniques, and do we have good mechanistic explanations for this like we're not you know yeah is it is just it plausible? drawing on yeah exactly we're not just drawing on this kind of pseudoscientific law of attraction or something and it was plausible i mean they were you know they've very neatly delineated the kind of the different pathways and you know some of it could be behavior which is a really you know a really important pathway in that if people have a more positive view of aging they're more likely to look after their bodies and to do exercise. But equally, when you look at people's stress responses, you see a very clear relationship. So people who see aging as this kind of negative process, who fear, you know, the decline in disability, um, they start to feel very vulnerable when they're doing all kinds of daily tasks. You know, going to the shops comes to feel more dangerous, meeting new people, traveling to a new location. Um, and then that causes them to have a steady rise in cortisol the stress hormone which in turn triggers inflammation and you can see this when you chart these people as they age it's both of those um physiological factors increase as they get older and both of those are then going to predispose someone to greater illness so over you know years and decades they're more likely to develop something like alzheimer's or heart disease than someone who has the positive mindset because with those people, you see that actually stress levels and inflammation decrease as they get older. It's, it was such a profound part of the book. I hadn't been aware of this. And, and since we met in the summer and we spoke at Cheltenham Science Festival, Rachel and I were, have been jumping about saying, oh, look, I've got some new grey hair. And uh, <laughs> I'm really pleased with <laughs> that. Right. And, uh, we, tried to, yeah. we tried to make it a feature of, uh, yeah. of, of daily life, of thinking, how am, I, how am I getting on? You know, I'm looking forward to the future and the opportunities that it... And that, that does have to feel like it's a, a, an active process to do that. But then that actually inspired me over the summer to read more about the blue zones and Dan Butner's work, mm, yeah. looking at these, these pockets of longevity. Um, so thank you for that inspiration that, that, that started me off in that direction. Um, but what seemed to be present there that really connected back to, to your work in, in the expectation effect was, was the role of 
older people that they felt like they had purpose they felt like they still had function and that they could see as they went from sort of grandmother to great grandmother that that their role and their wisdom was even more respected and um and so i could sort of see how that could perpetuate that particular mm. uh amplification of longevity or equally if people were lonely uh if people found things hard um mm. if they if they thought i won't go to the shops i'll get a delivery that it just erodes that physical activity step by step and and sends people down in a, to a a very different spiral yeah totally i visited one of the blue zones in sardinia and um I found those people very inspiring because, you know, they were still living a very active social life, you know, into their 90s and then their hundreds, um, and they were really valued by the community. And I think that then, you know, when you're seeing that, even when you're growing up, when you're younger, you're developing this view of aging that actually it's something to be embraced and celebrated. Um, and I think that's what we see with this research on the expectation effect concerning aging is that people are internalizing these kind of age stereotypes at a very young age and it might not start to impact your health until you reach middle age or say like a a landmark birthday but the fact is because you might before you reach that you might just be prejudiced to old people but think it doesn't concern yourself because you're young and then you reach that age point and suddenly you think well this applies to me all those awful things I've been thinking about older people are now you know are now applying to me and that's when you know life gets a lot more stressful and depressing and that has the health consequences. Mm. And um and you found it on a much more micro level didn't you this the the ability to to take on cognitive exercises, you could present information beforehand that would uh, help and hinder the ability to undertake a particular brain training task as well. Right. Yeah, exactly. So I think, you know, maybe they're not so popular now, but I think 10 years ago, you'd see a lot of these apps on like the, I think it's the Nintendo DS and, you know, all kinds of consoles and smartphones that promise to um, train your brain, and a lot of the a lot of scientific research initially seemed to back this up. They showed that people did show kind of IQ gains after they'd performed those um, that brain training. Um, but then this like really smart study from I think it was two thousand and fifteen questioned whether actually this was just an expectation effect caused by <laughs> the way those scientific trials had been advertised, because they were being advertised as an opportunity for you to try brain training. So the people who were going into the lab doing those games were expecting to have um, an increase in their cognitive ability. And then lo and behold, they did better on the, these tasks than, um, than people who were just doing this kind of neutral, um, uh, you know, like, activity that didn't feel very convincing you know like um watching a, a lecture on a dvd or you know something like that it didn't feel so kind of high tech and and like so it lowered their expectations of improvement um so what this researcher did he did a meta analysis of those previous studies looking at which ones had ad overtly advertised um participation in a brain training experiment and he found that actually <laughs> Ad, uh, the um, improvements were much more likely in the ones that had used the other advertising. And then he performed his own trial um, in which he recruited people through two separate posters. Some were just told they were going to come in to the lab and um, just to do some kind of, I can't remember how it was phrased, but it was some neutral description of the tasks. And the others were, you know, advertised overtly again as brain training. It was a chance to kind of boost your your cognitive potential and yeah he found that then those people who had the been primed with the positive expectations increased by about five iq points after doing this one hour training compared to people who um hadn't been primed with that positive expectation it's a fascinating study finding and it and, and it 
it gets me curious as to what's what's genuinely happening there every day for people are we are we going into tasks with a sort of a self defeatist approach or this is just mundane or if we go into something thinking this is going to be developmental this is going to be an opportunity for me that that you're actually just seeing your um, potential being lived out you're you're getting what you what you're capable of as opposed to <laughs> the negative preconditions actually reducing your capabilities that's that's what that's what that sort of gets me wondering about rather than it being any artificial boosting i'm always suscept i'm always yeah. suspicious of athletes thinking i'm going to get something extra that i'm not expecting if i believe it but i'm always yeah. very keen for athletes to be able to get what they know that they can do in competition mm. I mean, that's very much how I see it, um, is that often we're carrying around negative expectations of what we can achieve. Mm. Um, and that those are, you know, then they're acting as like breaks on our performance and our potential growth. And by shifting our expectations, we're just kind of releasing those breaks. Um, that's why I try to be really clear in the expectation effect, like, I'm not saying that like if you've been like a like if you're someone like me who's like enjoys fitness but I'm not a natural athlete and especially at my age of like 38 I cannot go to the gym and try to visualize I don't know like Tom Daly or I don't know Usain Bolt and then get on the treadmill and expect to like just like blast all my previous personal bests like something unrealistic like that is just not going to be helpful but what i have found helpful and what the research shows is that actually you know in the past i'd gone i'd been overly negative about my potential for fitness so i'd assumed that i had bad genes that were going to hold me back and that maybe i would just you know put in a lot of effort without getting anything out of it it had been um i'd based that on you know how i'd kind of experienced uh PE lessons at school you know I'd yeah, always okay. found them like quite unpleasant um and you know I just assumed I would always be kind of bad at fitness um but actually like you know so I just reappraised those particular expectations and was just like actually there's nothing about my body that is like inherently bad at um exercise and that actually there's so much abundant scientific proof that the more you put in the more you get out of it so even if i'll never compete in the olympics i'm gonna improve slowly day by day and i can focus on that trajectory and when i'm on the treadmill and i'm feeling a bit uncomfortable i can change those feelings of discomfort i can change my appraisal of those feelings of discomfort from something that is undesirable that's taken as evidence of my lack of fitness and I can instead see them as something uh positive they're a sign of my growth it's a sign that I'm actually when my muscles are aching that's a sign that I'm building strength when I'm out of breath that's a sign that I'm pushing my heart and my lungs just a bit further so that it's ultimately going to increase their capacity um now what the research shows and I experienced is that that can make the whole whole experience of exercise more pleasant like it reduces the perceived exertion so you don't feel that you're working out so hard you don't feel so exhausted in the moment um it can also have benefits you know for objective measures of stamina and even some physiological measures of what's happening in your body so things like how efficient your lungs are um at uh exchanging carbon dioxide for oxygen the efficiency of your movements like whether you're kind of moving further by burning less energy all of that can be affected by these expectations as well. And in no way did I have to be deceptive to myself or to believe, you know, that I was more capable than I really was. But I was just changing my interpretation of what I was capable of and my interpretation of what I was experiencing. You should get a job in this area. Uh, you should, uh, we should get you in front of some athletes. You could certainly help them. Uh, right, because so... So a couple of things there that, you know, this, this sort of mythological um, mother deadlifting a car uh, over, uh, away from a trapped 
child, for example, that sense of some supernatural um, gift from up on high that ena enabled them to do that. To, to me, that just sounds like somebody that could have deadlifted a car if they really wanted to. And they were, they were naturally strong and able to do that. You probably don't hear of the examples of where the mother tried to but couldn't because that's not oh. that's not as um well it's not as pleasant um the the research that i think um is relevant here is that if we if you take elite athletes and recreational exercises when they when they provide them with a pain stimulus that the in elite athletes are able to uh, distract themselves away from it they, they experience the same level of pain. Yeah. They have a coping me mechanism and they have a way of, of, of distracting. Mm. And there was, a, there was a study that I, I haven't seen repeated, but was quite compelling in its, in its idea about efficiency of running, so economy of movement on mm. a treadmill. And, yeah. and actually a lot of exercise physiologists like myself probably have to be aware of what you're saying when you've got somebody on a treadmill. Because if you... The, the study found that if you drew attention to running technique, if you mm. drew attention to breathing, for example, it actually made economy worse. But if you yeah. ask them to be thinking um, about the outdoors, thinking about, you know, something they really enjoy, you distracted them with a with a nice outdoor scene on a TV, mm. it distracted them away from things and made it less conscious and actually made it easier. And so that that sense of being able to use the mind to to just simply um, yeah reframe the experience. Yeah. Let, let me ask you a little bit about willpower. So limitless willpower. Really interesting chapter um, about this this idea that you potentially got a fatiguing uh, ability to make decisions and. And, and and do that well through the day. What were some of the major findings that and and practical implications that that people can benefit from in terms of preserving their ability to make good decisions? Yeah, I mean, so there had been in the past this idea of ego depletion, um, which you know kind of goes back to Freud, although he you know, spoke about it quite vaguely, but it's this idea that you have this kind of, um, you know, part of your psyche, the ego, that is, um, is trying to rein in the id, which is all about impulsivity, and it's trying to, you know, meet the goals of the uh, superego that, you know, wants you to kind of achieve higher things. And so, um, but, you know, Freud has suggested that actually the ego kind of needs energy to do so. And so when this idea was resuscitated in um, the 90s, uh, the idea was that, um, you know, Freud was talking maybe metaphorically, but actually like in the brain, it looked like um, self-control actually took energy. It takes um, glucose for it to be able to exert control. And the more you exert self-control, the more the ego becomes depleted to the point that eventually impulsivity takes over. So you can't focus your attention or resist temptation to achieve those bigger goals. Um, it's very interesting that that research happened in the West because in countries like India, they had a different view of willpower, which was that actually willpower can be self-sustaining that it's, you kind of get into the zone when you're doing a task and you actually find it easier to maintain your willpower to avoid distraction the more you go on. The same if you are uh, avoiding the temptation of eating cookies, it might be really tough for the first day, but then it's like you you kind of built that into your way of thinking. So the day, the next day and the next day, it's going to become easier. Um, now, what the latest research has shown is that actually both of those mindsets are correct because they both become self-fulfilling prophecies. So if someone 
really is invested and believes in this idea of ego depletion and they think that their willpower is very limited well then they actually experience ego depletion in these laboratory tasks and then in their day-to-day -day lives um they have a stressful day at work they really are more likely to go and have you know junk food after work and then to watch tv and skip the gym whereas people who have the non-limited view of willpower the one that's closer to the kind of cultural beliefs of, of the people in india they tend to experience the opposite they mm. they actually find it easier to to maintain their um their kind of focus as they get into a task um it actually empowers them so if they you know if a kid is at school and they're moving from one piece of homework to the other they will actually perform better on the second piece of homework because they've already kind of uh built up their willpower in the first piece of homework which <laughs> is very difficult for i think most uh, kids in the uk to believe but what veronica yorb um who i think she's based now at the university of vienna what she had shown is that these mindsets can be manipulated and simply by teaching people about the possibility of this non-limited willpower mindset just teaching people that actually this is possible for you to maintain your willpower and for it to grow as you practice it um can be very beneficial to people and it can actually then help you know create a new self-fulfilling prophecy that's fascinating it's just just a simple reframe or skill development mm. uh to be able to think about yourself as as resourceful and capable as opposed to a cultural or preconceived idea that you know you'll diminish through the day um yeah. very interesting and look this has been so fascinating to uh chat to you tap into this this these areas that you're researching do you do you tell yourself when you're writing and you're finding you've got writer's block do you tell yourself well, it's all going to come now because I've got unlimited willpower and it's all going to come now and it's all going to happen after my second stint of the day. I do. And also, I think, and this is maybe something that I did learn from my maths degree as well, which is that I think that trained me to reframe frustration before I was aware of all of this research and the fact is that frustration is like an agonizing emotion to be feeling like whether you're unable to solve this mass problem or unable to kind of come up with a good idea on the way to build this narrative in a chapter but you can see frustration as just an inevitable part of the creative process it's actually the feeling of being creative i think if if i was doing a very different task like admin i wouldn't really feel frustrated because it would be very easy you know it's a very logical sequence of steps to do without that need for new insights or for making new connections so I, I see frustration as being the feeling of your brain that's struggling to make those new connections and the research shows and it's what i experience is that once you you embrace frustration in that way it it helps you it actually helps those answers to come more quickly um i think that was what i learned in my master's degree was the as soon as I allowed myself to panic like that was when I was going to have like big problems with like completing my assignments and it's the same with writing it's just having the faith that it will come and liberating yourself to try all of those different avenues accepting that some will fail but just knowing that maybe you'll eventually find the one that does work and to know that you actually have to go through those failures to find that one that will work love that love that well, thank you for feeling those frustrations and uh, mm -hmm. and working through that and and writing your books. Are you allowed to say what your next topic is about, or is that yeah. just well, should we leave it suspenseful for next time? No, absolutely. So my next book is called The Laws of Connection, and it comes out in early June twenty twenty four, and it's looking at. Um, the science of being social and how that can transform our lives. So first of all, it's looking at why being social is so important for us as a species and particularly for our health. There's lots of research showing that um, engaging in social activities is as good for our health as things like exercising or eating a healthy diet or whether or not you smoke. You know, it's really important for, you know, 
all kinds of um, different measures of health, you know, how likely you are to die from cardiovascular disease, um, how likely you are to catch a cold even, um, or develop diabetes, you know, so many different measures all support this view that we could all do with being a little bit more sociable and forming deeper, meaningful relationships. That's really the key here, is it's not just having those superficial kind of um, or instrumental friendships you might have with people, uh, but it's actually feeling a sense of proper connection with them. And then the rest of the book looks at how we can go about that. And what I've uncovered by looking at all of the scientific research is that we often have lots of faulty intuitions, these kind of uh, social cognitive biases that prevent us from forming those relationships. We would all actually have a lot more potential to have a much stronger, more comforting, supportive social network if we only corrected these negative expectations. Um, and then I'll show you how to do that. Can't wait. Can't wait to read it. <laughs> um, sounds sounds fantastic. Look, thank you so much, David. I really appreciate the conversation. So enlightening, uh, so informed. And um, yeah, thank you so much. No, thank you. I've learned a lot as well. So thanks for sharing your perspectives. <laughs>